the air with millions of people bracing for more tornadoes. Live warnings down south as we speak for what our weather team is calling a serious and violent outbreak across the Gulf Coast. Dozens of reports of these storms are coming in and they are turning deadly. We're live in one Louisiana city under tornado watch tonight. Plus, a judge getting a first look at never before seen evidence from the attack on the husband of House Speaker Nancy Pelosi. We've got our reporter in San Francisco with what we know and what was played, including body cam video and the 911 call from Paul Pelosi. And we break down a so-called pump and dump plan by a couple of self-proclaimed stock market influencers. What we're learning now about this alleged nine-figure fraud scheme and a behind-the-scenes look at a wide-ranging investigation into the number one cause of death among young people in this country. Fentanyl, my San Diego is ground zero for the trafficking across the entire country. That's in the backstory. Plus, the shocking death of a beloved celebrity, the remembrances, and so much love for the DJ and dancer known as Twitch later on in the show. Hey, I'm Hallie, and we are watching a serious serious storm that is right over New Orleans as we speak, with three states now under a tornado watch. You've got the National Weather Service calling this a particularly dangerous situation, right as the cleanup is getting started in other parts of the country. You know the parts of the South got just ripped up after reports of at least 25 tornadoes, 10 of them confirmed in the last 24 hours. This is what it looked like. This is the devastation in Louisiana after these tornadoes ripped through mostly rural areas. We know now two people died in the storm near Shreveport, a 30-year-old and her 8-year-old son. And as we're coming on the air, we're also learning now of a third death in St. Charles Parish. You can see what it looked like here from the view of one driver in New Iberia, Louisiana, basically staring down the funnel of that tornado as it whips past. And you can see all the damage that the storm did to what used to be a hospital in that area. Thousands of people have no power. And in just the last couple of minutes, the state's governor says everybody in the storm's path has been accounted for, but that it's not likely they're going to get help from FEMA from this damage. He says the timing of the storm could not be worse. To have this kind of damage come through just before Christmas, uh, there's no good time for it, obviously. Uh, but uh, that's, that may be um, more than some of these people can bear. It's not just Louisiana. At least eight confirmed tornadoes tore up the Dallas area. Our climate team tells us this is really rare for December, the first outbreak near Dallas since 2015. And you know what's coming up the rear of this storm, what's bringing up the rear, a wave of blizzard warnings for 24 million people across the Midwest and the Northeast. Some places could get something like 20 inches of snow, making it super unsafe to drive. You can see why right here. So who's in the path next? The storm will shift now towards Florida and the Atlantic coast. Folks in Tampa, Charlottesville, Jackson, Charleston, they're going to need to watch out big time. Bill Cairns is going to break this down for us more in just a second. But let's start with Guad Venegas, who is in Baton Rouge, Louisiana. Um, and Guad, this is active. It is happening. It is happening now. Uh, and it is it is deadly at this point. Uh, Hallie, as we speak, the reports say that the dangerous part of the storm is going over the New Orleans area. You were showing different images. Uh, a lot of those are from today. Uh, New Iberia, that was earlier today. We saw the images. That's about 50 miles southwest of the Baton Rouge area where several people were trapped, had to be rescued. Uh, we've confirmed a third death uh, just moments ago. That was confirmed by authorities in St. Charles Parish. That's uh, just west of the New Orleans area. And then, of course, images of that damage in the northwest part of the state of Overnight, a mother and her son uh, who both died as a result of a tornado. And then just near there in another parish, also in northwest uh, Louisiana, several people uh, were injured. Now, authorities have said that the damage is still being assessed uh, here in Baton Rouge. Fortunately, we did have uh, some wind, some rain, uh, but no major tornadoes in this area have been reported. But we still have this storm that it's making its way through parts of Louisiana. And uh, people in other parts of the south are under alert for what could happen as the storm makes it its way. We're talking about these parts in Louisiana, and it goes as far uh, as Florida. So we're keeping a watch uh, to these tornadoes that are just popping up around different places as the storm makes its way through the south, Hallie. Guad Venegas live for us there in Louisiana. Thank you. Bill Cairns, let me go to you, because as we speak, right, or at least as I was walking into the studio, Bill, we were seeing a tornado watch. Um, I think you're showing it there on the Doppler in, in and around New Orleans. Walk us through what's going on now, what we need to know. Here's what we know. A tornado emergency is in effect. We have a tornado going through the New Orleans metro area at this time. We have confirmed damage in the Harvey right area. Yeah, right now. It's on the ground. Everyone in the New Orleans area is in their shelters. Uh, you know, People are taking their kids into the bathrooms. If they have storm shelters, they're getting interior rooms. It's about as scary a situation right now through downtown New Orleans as the residents will ever go through. Uh, it's confirmed possibly even a large, strong tornado going through the area. New Orleans is just this last little scan here. 
here. So this was the storm, and now it's moving about 45 miles per hour. It is now exiting downtown New Orleans. It looks like it couldn't even have hit right towards the, you know, the downtown area there, right near the waterfront. And now it's heading up here towards the northeast section. So again, still confirmed tornado uh, so right through the heart of New Orleans, as serious as it gets. Uh, we don't have reports yet of just how strong it was or how much damage has been done, Hallie. But major, major, huge population center confirmed I was just gonna strong say, Bill, tornado. Because so far what we've seen from a lot of these tornadoes is that it has been more rural areas. Boy, New Orleans is not that, right? I mean, so many people. It is, it is a very densely populated city. Um, this will probably be, I'm, I'm trying to think in my head, how many tornado emergencies we've had for bigger cities than this. And off the top of my head, I really can't think of them. Wow. Um, so this is a pretty rare event. Uh, the New Orleans area was hit by a pretty strong tornado in the springtime, if you remember back. Uh, we'll wait and see. We'll get these reports in during the hour in the show. We'll update you and let you know just how bad it is. Um, you know, I'll take a wider view now because this isn't over yet. Obviously, we're going to focus on what's happening in the New Orleans area throughout this hour. But we've had numerous, you know, over two dozen tornado reports. This tornado watch is what we call a PDS tornado watch, a particularly dangerous situation. So this is what's happening in New Orleans right now. And that's actually the only active tornado warning we have on the map. At one point, we had 12 tornado warnings at one time, mostly in Mississippi. And we still don't even know how bad some of those were in the more rural areas. I know Hattiesburg had tornado warnings all afternoon, significant flash flooding as they went through also. And so then later this evening, so the storm line, the threat is right now about New Orleans to Hattiesburg. Later, Biloxi, Mobile, and Jackson, you're in this moderate risk. Call it a four out of a five. There's only one category higher. And then we'll take those storms overnight towards Pensacola. And this is the area that we're worried about the most for tornadoes. And that's happening as we speak. So, Hallie, uh, again, I'll give you updates throughout the hour as we get say, it in. Me, yeah. Because I think it's super important to be to be in this moment right now, because this, as you say, this is serious, this is scary. And I just want to pull back the curtain a little bit for viewers. We obviously can't show anything right now because there's nothing to show, right? Because nobody is out there trying to capture this video other than maybe Bill Storm Chasers. And then it takes a minute to turn that stuff around, obviously. Yeah, well, we have our NBC affiliate, WDSU, that's been They've live streaming. They've been on the air with live coverage, by the way, yeah. Right, and now, you know, so they have their tower cams and stuff, but you can see this was the possible tornado. So to have a storm chaser viewing it, it's kind of swampy areas to the south here. And most of the population areas were in the rain as the storm approached. It was actually pouring in New Orleans before the tornado even got there. So there was a lot of lightning and pouring, and then all of a sudden you got the tornado warning and the sirens started going off. And we're still indicating a decent amount of rotation with it, but unfortunately, it looks like, Hallie, this storm peaked in intensity right as it was approaching downtown New Orleans. So again, We'll wait and see. I mean, hopefully it was only on the ground a short period of time. We know for a fact it has done some damage, um, but we just don't know to what severity at this time. It, in my opinion, looking at radar as this was approaching, it was about as serious as it gets. And you know, we, have, we, we have what we call a Fujita scale um, for how we measure the intensity of tornadoes. You know, EF0 yeah. is the weakest. EF5 is the strongest. Those are extremely, extremely rare. This looked to be somewhere in the middle, possibly winds 120 to 150 miles per hour, which would be like an EF2 or or EF3, and that would be significant, significant, you know, not just life-threatening, but injuries, infrastructure, you name it, if that happened in this populated area. Uh, Bill Karens, I'm going to let you get back to your desk to be able to do yeah. some more sleuthing on this front. Can you please, please, though, I mean, in 10, 15 minutes, we're going to check back in with you. Bill Karens, thank you. We'll see you again here in the show. Let's talk about one of the other big headlines of the day, that it is going to be costing all of us to borrow money a little bit more, right? That expense is going to go up after the Fed today did what everybody thought they would do and raise interest rates. They did it. It's another half point up. And the expectation now, right, as we read the hints and the signals from the Fed chair is that they will keep raising those rates right through the next calendar year to try to get a handle on inflation. And by the way, rates that are already now at a 15 year high, the highest they've been in a decade and a half. Here's what Jerome Powell, the Fed chair, had to say a couple minutes ago. It will take substantially more evidence to give confidence that inflation is on a sustained downward path. So it's going to keep costing more to use your credit card, to get a car loan, maybe to buy a house, with the market seeming a little bit worried about what more rate hikes could mean for them. Look at the Dow, the S&P, the Nasdaq, all in the red at close not too long ago. Brian Chung joins me now. Brian, um, you were there at the news conference. I know you got a question into the Fed chair, um, basically about the pain that this is going to, that Americans are feeling right yeah. now. Um, talk us through 
One thing, that, one thing about Jay Powell, he'll signal what he wants to signal. And it feels like the tea leaves are all pointing to more interest rate hikes in 2023. What does that mean for all of us? Yeah, well, I mean, this has been the talking point for the Fed. We're going to let everyone know exactly what we're going to do. And they telegraphed that they were going to go by half a percentage point today. And then they did. Now, what does that mean for Americans? Because we heard Jay Powell earlier in the year say, look, these interest rate hikes are going to cause some pain. And translation, well, higher inflation rates means that it's eroding workers' wages, but it also can mean the hinting at job loss in next year. Now, unemployment's at 3.7% yeah. right now, but the Fed is projecting that that could go up to 4.6% next year. That would be a million and a half people losing their jobs. So I asked Jay Powell, what does the pain look like right now? Take a listen to what he said. The largest amount of pain, the worst pain would come from a failure to raise rates high enough and from us allowing inflation to become entrenched in the economy becoming entrenched in the economy. And that's very much a challenging situation for the Federal Reserve when you consider that this is a central bank that is trying to engineer this soft landing, right? But that can't happen if unemployment spikes. That's the thing. And that's why, you know, it's funny talking with our folks with you and the folks over at CNBC on this. Like, the whole issue is, are we in a recession or not? The unemployment rate tends to be part of an indicator there. But mm -hmm. if it starts to go up, I mean, at that point, isn't it pretty clear that we would be in a recession, given where inflation is? I mean, that would be a big part of it, right? Because it, this economy is very weird right now. The inflation side of things is, is not good, yeah. right? 7.1 percent. Historic, that, right. Yeah, that's an improvement from the 9 percent right. that we saw earlier in the year. But Unemployment is still near 50-year lows, right? It's at 3.7%. Now, we hadn't seen 3.5% since September, right? But then before that, it was 1969 that we saw that rate. So if it goes up to 4.7% or 4.6%, that's not the worst, right? I mean, we saw that spike a lot higher during the great financial crisis in 2008. But that's still, again, 1.5 million people. Who are those people? Right, are they right. low-income people that were particularly hurt during the pandemic, when they a lot of those service jobs were, were eliminated. That's a big question. You know, before I let you go here, we've been, we see that number too, 7.1% is with yeah. the inflation rate. That is not historic. We've seen history made this year as it relates to inflation, at least from the last several decades. Um, the question is, we also showed a, a graphic showing how this rate hike was less than expected, right? They're slowing it a little less than expected. What could happen in the next calendar year that would convince the Fed and Jay Powell to change their minds? Like, what would they need to see to be able to say, OK, like, actually, we're in better shape than we thought? Well, I mean, if you look directionally, right, the fact that they were going by 0.75 percentage points in the last four consecutive meetings, and now they're going by a half percentage point, maybe they go by a quarter, and then maybe they stop entirely, right? But all that is going to be dependent on how inflation develops. It's very clear that this Federal Reserve is willing to let the unemployment rate go up. That could be a mistake, but that's what they said they're going to do. If, it, if inflation doesn't end up getting down to what the 3% they're projecting it to be by the end of next year, maybe they have to get more aggressive. If it ends up coming down faster, maybe they can stop. It all depends on the data. Brian Chung, thank you so much. Appreciate it. Breaking news out of San Francisco as we come on the air with a judge just literally in the last two or three minutes ruling that there is enough evidence to charge the man accused of breaking into the home of House Speaker Nancy Pelosi and attacking her husband, Paul, to go to trial. He will now be going to trial. That was the subject. That was the decision in front of this judge today uh, in a hearing where there were vivid new details that we have never before seen or heard about what happened in the moments that Paul Pelosi was attacked with a hammer. Over the last few hours in this courtroom, you saw, for example, 911 audio from that day, the body cam video of police responding to that call, and the hammer itself that investigators say the suspect used during the attack. Apparently, he told police there was evil in Washington, but that he wasn't trying to target the House Speaker's husband specifically. That's according to testimony from a San Francisco police sergeant we heard from today. Jake Ward is following this for us. And Jake, take us inside the courtroom here, because and let me explain to people, we couldn't bring our cameras in court, right? That is why we're not showing you some of this stuff that we're talking about here. But, but lay out the headlines here, because it, clearly it was persuasive to the judge that it was enough evidence from the prosecutors that this should go to trial, and it, and it will. That's absolutely right, Hallie. This was a very vivid day in court. And if the question had been, is there enough evidence to go to trial? Well, that was certainly answered uh, by what everyone in that courtroom saw. I mean, we first, of course, saw the uh, heard audio from the 911 call. And I think in both that and in the video, what we were reminded of was the incredible composure of Mr. Pelosi, that this grandfather, woken in the middle of the night by an obviously deranged man, uh, you know, threatening him, his wife, asking where his wife was going to be. You know, David DePap told uh, police later that he intended to break the knees of Nancy Pelosi if she lied to him under interrogation. I mean, this was a man with terrible intentions. You have Mr. Pelosi saying to the 911 operator in this very calm voice, there's a gentleman here who wants to speak to my wife. He does not uh, sound in any way 
alarmed, even though he is trying to get across the incredible danger he is in. And then it is, of course, the body cam footage that riveted everybody's attention. I mean, we really had this footage in which one of the two responding officers comes in the door, and the footage shows the two men, Mr. DePap and Mr. Pelosi, standing there together pretty calmly, holding the hammer together. And then it's when the officer says, drop the hammer, that all hell breaks loose. That's when Mr. Pelosi is struck. And then as that sergeant, as you mentioned, uh, uh, he, he describes in his testimony, he says that's when Mr. Pelosi wound up face down in a pool full of blood. I mean, a really frightening, frightening amount of evidence here. And just yeah. a reminder of how awful it was for this man and how incredibly composed he was in keeping this man calm as, as as calm as he did and in somehow getting across to this 911 operator that he was in real trouble and needed somebody to come to the house right away Howie. And how quickly it happened too, right, Jake? Because if you look at some of the timing of what the body cam video that played out of the 911 call, this all, especially when, once the officer got to the door, the officers, this went down incredibly quickly. That's right. It's the incredible fast speed with which things happen once the police officers arrive. But again, just it speaks to the incredible presence of mind of Mr. Pelosi that he was able yeah. to keep this guy calm for as long as he did. Also worth pointing out here that we now know, based on this hearing and other testimony, for, uh, other interviews with Mr. DePap, uh, that he had more people in mind than just Ms. Pelosi. He was interested in the actor Tom Hanks. He wanted to go after Governor Gavin Newsom. He had a list of people in mind for this kind of, of uh, uh, you know, whatever it was he, he had in mind here, right? But obviously uh, scary and dangerous and violent intentions here. And so, uh, you know, we just see just how close uh, it came to, you know, thank God the speaker was not home and thank, uh, you know, God that, that Mr. Pelosi wasn't more badly injured than he was. Again, just the close call after close call on vivid display here in the courtroom here today in San Francisco, Cali. Jake Ward, and of course the news that this will go to trial. Uh, DePop will next be uh, presumably in court, at least for an arraignment, a few days after Christmas. Jake, thank you very much. Let's talk about the pressure building on Capitol Hill to do something to regulate cryptocurrency. After the spectacular, epic collapse, pick your adjective, of FTX, the crypto exchange run by the so-called crypto king, Sam Bankman Freed. You've got two senators from different sides of the aisle, Elizabeth Warren, Roger Marshall, putting in a proposal to try to close a loophole on money laundering in crypto. Coming as senators are hearing from a panel of experts, including Kevin O'Leary, a.k.a. Mr. Wonderful from Shark Tank. You recognize him? He was a paid FTX spokesperson. Ben McKenzie was there. Ryan from the OC. Recognize him? He's now a well-known author and critic of crypto. And McKenzie, boy, not mincing any words when it comes to how he feels about the whole business. Watch. In my opinion, the cryptocurrency industry represents the largest Ponzi scheme in history. As for Bankman Freed, SBF, as he's known, there he is. You see him there being let out of his initial court hearing late last night in the wee hours. His extradition hearing is not going to happen for another couple of months, which means he will be posted up in the Bahamas until then. Garrett Hake is joining us live now from Capitol Hill. And Garrett, you know, this is interesting when you look at the landscape that crypto finds itself in now. Setting aside SBF and what happened there. We'll know more after the extradition hearing in February. You've got lawmakers now, some of them, looking to put in place more regulation and introducing legislation to do that. But, Garrett, if wishes were horses and legislation were, was action, uh, there would be a million new regulations on, like, Facebook and social media. In, in other words, it's going to be a long road ahead for anything to get done on this crypto push. I was wondering where you were going with that metaphor, Hallie, but, but I think now, your right? point is, is I think your point is well taken. Look, um, crypto is an issue on which Congress has been caught completely flat-footed. I mean, we've seen this with the tech industry writ large, but it's especially true when it comes to cryptocurrency that Congress is trying to play catch-up here, and the ideas about how or whether to regulate it vary wildly. Take, for example, the chairman of the Senate Banking Committee, Sherrod Brown, saying this about the entire industry today. We know this is bigger than FTX. This is a, they have made no real, there's been no real um, argument in support of the whole crypto industry. That's the Senate banking chairman essentially arguing that there's not a good argument for cryptocurrency to exist. That's an idea held by some lawmakers. There are some who feel like it's the kind of thing that's a center of innovation. It's the future of money. And if the United States doesn't make a hospitable home for it, some other country will. Hallie, this is a mess. And that proposal you discussed from Senator Elizabeth Warren, which is really, and, and Roger Marshall, a Republican of Kansas, is really just a narrow piece of the regulatory puzzle right. here, trying to focus 
just on money laundering. Getting their arms around this issue more broadly is something that has proven un, uh, un, un, unaccomplishable for this Congress. Maybe better luck next year. How much is this breaking through and just the buzz and the conversation there with folks you're talking to on the Hill, Garrett? Because there was the specter, of course, of the potential breaking of campaign finance laws as it came to SBF, who donated a ton of money uh, to, to politicians, to lawmakers here. Are people like this is in my group chats. Is it in members of Congress's? I think it is. I mean, it's been interesting to watch this issue evolve in Congress because over the summer we saw a fairly comprehensive regulatory bill get introduced by Kirsten Gillibrand and Cynthia Lummis, another bipartisan Senate pair that tried to get their arms around the cryptocurrency industry more broadly. That didn't get out of the banking committee. It went almost nowhere. But over the last couple of months where you've had this kind of broad spectrum collapse in crypto, whether it be um, FTX going bankrupt or Bitcoin losing a ton of its value, uh, I think that has, has helped wake up Congress to this issue and the fact that this isn't a fad that's necessarily going to go away on its own. It's something that they're going to have to address at some point. But as I said, the, the ideas of how to do that vary incredibly widely and when House Republicans get a bigger seat at the table in the spring in the new Congress, they're going to bring their own ideas to it. So, Hallie, the, the prospect of anything on this issue making it to the president's desk anytime soon I think is pretty slim. Jared Hake, thank you very much for that reporting. Appreciate it. Coming up, we're going to take you back to what's happening in New Orleans with an apparent tornado touching down. We're going to get an update on that in just a minute. Plus, Peru's new government declaring a police state now over protests turning violent. We'll talk about what's going on there and the five things. And the last match now set, who's playing in the World Cup final this weekend in a bit. President Biden tonight is hosting nearly 50 leaders from African countries at the White House for dinner in the only second ever African Union summit in Washington. And in the last couple hours, the president says it's all about what he calls shared success. When Africa succeeds, the United States succeeds. Quite frankly, the whole world succeeds as well. Now, the White House says this meeting is all about Africa, but in a lot of ways, it's about China, too. Why? because of Beijing's relationship with the continent. You've got China investing huge amounts of money through trade in Africa, nearly a third more just since 2019. The U.S. is trading more with Africa also, but you see the numbers here, right? It's just a fraction of what China's doing. Carol Lee is live for us in Washington. Carol, talk through some of the timing here on this. Yeah, well, if you look at why now, Hallie, the question, the answer to that is, according to White House officials, that if you look at where the president has been during his first two years in office, where his focus has been, he's focused a lot on Europe, rebuilding alliances, focused on the war in Ukraine, of course. He's traveled to the Middle East. He's traveled to Asia multiple times. He held the Summit of the Americas. Africa is the one space where the president just hasn't had a lot of focus. And so now he's doing that. And part of the challenge is that he's playing a bit of catch up with China and Russia, having made inroads in Africa in recent years significantly. And he's also facing this uphill battle where, you know, the African leaders have seen this before, this attention from the United States, and then it fades away. And so what the president's trying to do here is make the case that he's in it for the long haul, that this is something that his attention is going to continue to be focused on. And so to back that up, he's making a number of announcements. He's announcing $55 billion in a commitment to invest $55 billion in Africa over the next three years. That depends a little on Congress, obviously. Um, and also other things, trade initiatives, energy, clean energy initiatives, things to combat climate change, other thing, other economic initiatives, security, food security. And he's also going to announce tomorrow that he will, the U.S. supports the African Union, becoming a permanent member of the G20. And two administration officials tell me that the president is expected to announce tomorrow that he intends to travel to Africa next year. And so all of that is designed to try to convey the message, including the, the U.S. naming a special representative who's tasked with trying to follow up on what happens here at the Africa, African Leaders Summit. All of that's designed to say, hey, we're in it to play. We don't, you know, you don't have to choose between China and Russia or the U.S., but look at all we have to offer. That's, kind of, that's the way that the U.S. is approaching this. Carol Lee, live for us outside the White House. Carol, thank you. Let's get you back to Bill Karens now, who's looking at the storm over New Orleans right now. We have some new video that is just into us. I want to play for it because the National Weather Service is confirming, oh, man, it is a tornado. Look at this. Um, it's just a quick, quick shot of that video. That, that looks... Uh, Bill Karens, that doesn't look great. 
Uh, it looks like a, probably an EF2, EF3 tornado. I've seen other angles uh, that video we're trying to get cleared to show you guys. And uh, we know that this went through the West Bank. Um, just across the river from downtown New Orleans. I know that uh, we've had reports from people in Canal Street um, in the, you know, the French quarters. They had debris falling out of the clouds, roofing materials and insulation. So in other words, this tornado on the West Bank was destroying things, picking it up, throwing it up into the thunderstorm, and then it was falling down somewhere else. Uh, we also know that this has weakened since then, but I could, the, you know, I can look at the power outages across the New Orleans area, and it appears that the tornado was on the south side of the Mississippi River, so the West Bank, and then it went in an area like this towards Harvey, and then so okay. in, then into the Ninth Ward. Uh, Arabi was hit by an EF3 March 22nd of this year, and I just saw pictures, and they have power outages. It looks like they've been hit by a second strong tornado in one year, and, and honestly, in nine months, which is insane to think about for them. But again, it doesn't look like it went through downtown New Orleans. It's on the West Bank. It went over the expressway at rush hour, and and there was a lot of rain, so people didn't know it was probably coming unless they had their radio on or their alerts on their phone. So, you know, you get very concerned with people with very little amount of warnings, Hallie, and the possible injuries and fatalities we could have from this as we learn more in the next couple hours. You're bringing up a really important point here, Bill, which is that it is basically rush hour, right? I mean, commuters are on the road when this thing was coming, basically barreling towards the heart of New Orleans. We talk a lot about how tornadoes at night can increase the risk if people aren't able to, you know, hear the warnings and get to shelter. But man, Bill, if you're in your car and it's raining and you think it's a thunderstorm and you don't know the tornado's coming, I mean, what, what, what kind of alerts would go out in that situation? What are you supposed to do in that situation? I mean, in that situation, you get as low as you can in your vehicle because you want to avoid any projectiles shooting through your car and hitting you. I mean, that's the only thing you can do if you're in a vehicle. Um, what you're looking at in that video, by the way, in case, you know, that's the tornado on the left side right there. And then it looks like the person that was filming this, you know, must have went to shelter yeah, as so they saw that coming in. Sure. Yeah, so that's the tornado as they saw it coming on the left side of the screen. Um, you know, the, the reports, it doesn't look like this was an EF4 or EF5. Uh, this would be the type of tornado that would tear the roof off of houses. It would um, destroy mobile homes, uh, brick and cement and concrete. Homes and buildings would have windows smashed in, but those structures would likely still be standing. Uh, so uh, something like this, we're hoping people were able to get to shelter. One other yeah. thing, if we come back to the maps here, you know, this is a live radar. This is a slow moving storm system. It is pouring and there's a lot of active lightning right over the top of this area where the tornado hit. So the first responders and everyone that's rushing to the scenes, I mean, they are in, you know, very inclement conditions. It looks like in about a half hour from now, the rain should get a little bit lighter and all the first responders rushing to those areas. Emergency managers have said there is significant damage. Uh, obviously, they're just trying to do the assessments and go rescue people uh, out of the rubble or out of the destruction that has already occurred. Bill Karens, thank you for staying on top of it. Um, I know you're staying close to the camera. We'll have you back with any updates as we get them. We're hoping, obviously, that everybody in New Orleans is okay, that they manage to get to shelter and safety with that tornado, as you just saw, ripping through. We're going to sneak in a quick break. We'll be right back on the other side with more headlines from the day. Let's get you over to the five things our team thinks you should know about tonight. Number one, Russia launching a big drone attack on Kyiv this morning, but it only damaged a few buildings. Ukraine says it managed to shoot down 13 drones. The U.S. will probably approve sending the advanced Patriot air defense system to Ukraine pretty soon, maybe as soon as later this week. Number two, Peru's new government is declaring a statewide nationwide, rather, state of emergency today, suspending civil liberties, including the right of assembly for a month, 30 days. It's in response to violent protests in Peru that erupted when the president was ousted last week, Pedro Castillo. He tried to dissolve Congress before a planned impeachment vote. Then he was arrested. Protesters want him out, freed. They want a successor to resign and a new election scheduled. Number three, NASA's Perseverance Mars rover captured something we have never heard before. Listen. That little staticky rumbling, that is the first ever audio of a dust devil on Mars. Basically a whirlwind on the planet, according to scientists. Sounds a lot like Earth dust devils. That's a Martian one. Some pretty good timing, too. The rover only has its microphone on for a couple of minutes every few days. 
Number four, about 1.4 million Ram pickup trucks are being recalled worldwide. Its parent company, Stellantis, says the tailgates may not shut totally, so if you're hauling a bunch of stuff, there's a risk that can spill into the road. The recall covers some trucks from the past four model years. The company says customers will get notified next month, and owners should figure out a way to secure the cargo and the truck bed in the meantime. Pro tip. Number five, House Speaker Nancy Pelosi's portrait was just unveiled at the Capitol. It'll eventually hang in the Speaker's lobby, joining the portraits of other House Speakers. Pelosi will be the first woman to have her portrait hang there. Her predecessor, former Ohio Republican Congressman John Boehner, spoke at the ceremony in a show of bipartisan support. Uh, okay, gang, spoiler alert, because if you don't know the news by now, I'm about to tell you who is going to be in the finals match at the World Cup. If you're, like, waiting to watch the game because you DVR'd it or whatever, turn it off now, but... Finals are set. France v. Argentina on Sunday. That's after France just beat Morocco late today. 2 nothing, And both teams made some history. Morocco was the first African country to get to the semifinals. And France, which won the Cup in 2018, is the first team in 20 years to make it to two straight finals. I want to bring in Megan Fitzgerald, who is live for us now in Doha. And Megan, um, set the scene for us today, because it wasn't just the semifinals. It was the history here. Morocco being a French colony. There was a lot going on. There was a lot of, again, we talked a lot about geopolitical intrigue during these, these World Cups um, matches. That was the same today. Yeah, Holly, you're absolutely right. I mean, that certainly is in the backdrop here. I mean, you know, as you mentioned, France colonized Morocco. They gained their independence in the 1950s. Um, that's still lingering. Uh, and, you know, we seemingly saw uh, the president of France, Emmanuel Macron, trying to quell tensions. I want to read for you just a little bit of the tweet that he put out. Uh, he says, sport brings us together before anything in respect and friendship between the two nations friendship between the two nations. So trying to bring people together and, and quell tensions. We saw, um, you know, some scenes play out in Paris when uh, the, the teams knew that they were going to be playing each other. Um, but look, when you look at the pitch, this was a hard-fought game. The focus was on trying to win. Um, and that's what we saw from Morocco. I mean, they came out strong, um, holding their own throughout the entire game. They had several attempts on the goal. They just couldn't connect with the back of the net. Uh, in the end, it was France with a 2-0 victory, and they will be heading on to the finals to take on Argentina. Talk about the finals then, because this is a dramatic one, right? Messi playing what some people are speculating might be his last yeah. World Cup ever, right, against the defending champs. There's a lot of storylines on that one. Absolutely. I mean, Lionel Messi is a guy who has practically every major title uh, in soccer, except for one, and that's the World Cup. So, you know, that's what he's going for on Sunday. Um, and, you know, a lot of people think that that's what's going to happen. I mean, the fan base here for Argentina is deep. There's a lot of people here cheering for Argentina. Um, but, of course, you know, we'll see what happens, because then you also have France, the defending 2018 champions, just took the pitch, uh, just wrapped up a game where they looked really strong. So, what we know for sure is that Sunday is going to be a really good game to watch, Hallie. And you're going to have real good seats for it. Megan Fitzgerald, thank you so much. Good to see you. We are learning more today as we talk about the World Cup of what led to the death of soccer writer Grant Wall last week in Qatar while he was covering these matches. His wife, Dr. Celine Gounder, writing in a statement that it was an aortic aneurysm, basically the main blood vessel leading from the heart ruptured. It apparently had been growing slowly and went undetected. Here's Dr. Gounder. It's just one of these things that had been likely brewing for years. Um, and for whatever reason, it happened at this point in time. Dr. Gounder's statement also suggests that there was nothing nefarious about Grant Wall's death. And his brother, who initially raised questions last week, says he no longer suspects foul play. Dr. John Torres is joining us now. Um, Dr. John, help us understand this, because these types of aneurysms are more common for men over 60, according to people who study this kind of thing. Are there risk factors here? Can you even tell if you have something like this? And Hallie, there are risk factors here, and like you mentioned, age is one of them, 60 and above. As a matter of fact, the U.S. Preventative Services Task Force says if you're 65 to 75, and if you've ever smoked any time in your life, you should get an ultrasound just to check, because this is a silent condition that kind of carries on for years and years. And like you mentioned, it's the major blood vessel that comes out of the heart throughout the body, all the way down essentially to the belly button. 
And if this starts getting weak, it can start bulging out. And it can happen because of high blood pressure, high cholesterol. Those are the biggest factors that you can still control with medications and, and lifestyle type things. But the biggest behavioral aspect is smoking. 75% of people that have aneurysms have them because they were smokers sometime in their life. And so again, looking at these risk factors can give you an idea of something like this might be happening, but at the same time, this is a silent condition, like unfortunately what happened here, where it can go on years and years, and then all of a sudden it just gets to the point where it either gets so big or ruptures that it causes problems. Well, that's the question, right? Because Grant, who, you know, is, is people who watch the show know is a friend of the show, just an, an incredible person and journalist, and had been sort of writing in the days before his death that he hadn't been feeling well, but um, he was diagnosed with bronchitis, right? Like, you, you say it is sort of a, a potentially a silent killer here. Is there anything that would give you a clue short of like a full scan from doctors, which why would you go in to do that unless you think something's wrong? And Hallie, the biggest symptom is having this abrupt onset of symptoms. And like possibly what happened here, if the blood vessel starts getting large, if it starts bulging out to the point where it's pressing against the breathing tube or it's occupying space in the chest, it can cause chest pain, it can cause chest pressure, it can cause breathing problems, coughing, those types of things. But those are indications of a lot of other things as well. And so not necessarily the first thing we think about is this type of aneurysm. There are 10,000 deaths a year from this, over 100,000 people do have it, but at the same time, it's not the most common thing out there. Yeah. But Again, if this thing happens, the, the major symptom is a severe onset of symptoms. So if these things happen all of a sudden, you know your body, go ahead and get it checked out. Dr. John Torres, thank you very much for that. Appreciate it. Coming up, another reported shark attack in Hawaii. What officials are saying about how somebody tried to fight it off coming up in the local. The SEC and DOJ are charging eight social media influencers in this absolutely bizarre $100 million coordinated fraud scheme that they say has been going on for years. Here's the influencers, Dip Deity, Stock I'm sorry, Stock Sniper. Am I saying that right? Stock Sniper. Uh, Zach Morris, Mystic Mac, not the Zach Morris, who is, by the way, a fictional character. They'd allegedly buy a bunch of stock at a low price and hype themselves up on Twitter and Discord as successful traders, promoting the stock to everybody who followed them. The SEC says once their followers jumped on board and the demand for that stock went up, they would sell their shares and make money off of it. And they were allegedly still promoting the stocks even after they sold them and never told their followers they cashed out. To cover it all up, they allegedly deleted old messages on social media and lied about why the stock prices went down. CNBC reached out to a few of these influencers on social media for comment, but did not immediately hear back. Joining us now is Ken Delanian. So, Ken, the SEC basically is calling this a pump and dump scheme, okay? Um, and it's not like these were like, we're not talking about like, I don't even know if I should name like a really high profile influencer, but there, I mean, 2 million people, that's a, still a lot of people. Is it's, that what caught the SEC's attention on this? It seems likely. I mean, look, pump and dump schemes, Hallie, are as old as the stock market. And if yeah. you've watched The Wolf of Wall Street, you know what they are. But it seems like the world of social media has really added rocket fuel to these things. It makes it a lot easier to tout a stock on false premises, uh, which these guys allegedly right. did, uh, and then dump it. Uh, and you know, it's a way to spread information that before, obviously, the Internet existed, people were calling people on the phone to do this kind of thing. Right. Now it's just, it's it's uh, at a massive scale. Well, when you, like, unless you had a, you know, when you're doing it online, you're typing it out, the receipts exist, and the yeah. SEC has them, because yeah. this um, complaint shows hundreds of tweets, a transcript of a chat on Discord that they didn't know was being recorded, where one of them says, get caught, we're robbing effing idiots of their money. Yeah. And by the way, there's a civil complaint by the SEC. These guys are also charged criminally by the Justice Department. They've been indicted. So they're in big, big trouble. What does that mean? What are the consequences? Could they be banned from stock trading altogether? The SEC could do that civilly, but they're facing 25 years in prison, each of them. Meaning like the stock trading thing is the least of their concerns. Exactly. Um, how often does this happen? Pump and dump schemes are, are not uncommon, but this is a really big one, an interesting one. It makes you wonder how often this is happening at a lower level because it's so easy to do on yeah. social media. Ken Delanian, thank you so much. Appreciate it. We'll keep an eye on that one. Time now to get to our The Backstory, our behind-the-scenes look at how a story comes together and how it fits into our bigger picture. And tonight, we're looking at a new in-depth investigation called Cartel Rx, a seven-part report from The Washington Post into the fentanyl epidemic that we've talked a lot about on this show. A team of reporters at The Post went to find out more, shadowing the multi-agency task force that specializes in tracking fentanyl shipments from Mexico to the U.S. They found that San Diego is actually ground zero for fentanyl trafficking here. The drugs trace back to labs and cartels in northern Mexico. After that, it crosses over the border to stash houses in places like L.A. and Phoenix. 
And from there, street-level drug dealers take over. The DEA says it's now taking direct aim at the cartels and the fentanyl crisis. Nick Miroff was one of the reporters on this story and joins us now. Nick, thank you for being on the show, um, especially for a segment like this, which really intends to sort of pull back the curtain. Tell us how you did the journalism you did, right? Because this, um, the backdrop to this is the crisis that fentanyl is creating in this country, the leading cause of death for younger Americans, 18 to 49. How did this first come together? How did you and your colleagues basically pitch this and then try to get it off the ground? Yeah, well, I mean, sometimes as a reporter, you're confronted by like a, a single fact that is just so uh, astonishing. It really piques your curiosity and makes you want to learn more and find out more and tell other people. And for me, that was seeing that more than 100,000 Americans were dying every year from fatal overdoses. And so, uh, you know, we once we started digging, we realized that almost all of those were people killed by uh, illegal fentanyl. And that, want, that prompted us to want to know, where is it coming from? How is it being made? How is it spreading across the United States? And, and most importantly, why aren't more people talking about this? And mm. and so that was really the you know the the, the guiding uh, star for us, the, the thing that really drove us to wanna to wanna do this series, and that's what what you see now today in the pages of the Post. And people did open up to you about this. I'm thinking of Ed Byrne, who's a Homeland Security investigations agent out in California, who alone has seen something like 500 people die from overdoses. Talking with families, um, how, how easy was it to get people? like Ed to talk to you, to open up to you, to share with you so candidly what they see and experience? Or how not easy well, was it, right? Yeah, I mean, well, usually, you know, federal law enforcement agents are not uh, eager to, to speak to journalists and Washington Post investigators. Um, but in this case, you know, I think that there's a level of, of frustration and, and a real sense that, that people just weren't paying attention, that they're, you know, one of the things that, that Ed, Ed Byrne told us uh, at one point is, you know, where where is the outrage? You know, here's a guy who has personally been to nearly 500 fatal fentanyl overdoses. And, you, you know, he just sees this death accumulating and accumulating. And, and you know, because there isn't that, that level of outrage, I think he was, he was really uh, open to, you know, to talking to us to, 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 you know, to see that here are some reporters who, who want to tell the story, who want to alert the public. And so he was, he was so helpful to us. And, and that's why, you know, his story is, is the, was the lead story in our series. Um, did anything you learned surprise you as somebody who covers immigration enforcement, as somebody who, you know, and you, Nick, are familiar, you know, and have reported on the Department of Homeland Security for the Post? Yeah, and, and I've been covering drugs and drug trafficking for a long time. You know, I think in addition just to the overwhelming death toll from, from fentanyl, one of the things that astonished me the most was how just how cheap it's gotten. Um, mm. You know, the, the price of, of, a, of a single fentanyl pill on the streets of Phoenix or Los Angeles is down to like four or five dollars. And so the cost of, of, of addiction has gone down at the same time that the potency of these pills has gone up. And, and to the extent that, you know, just one pill for somebody who doesn't have an opioid tolerance is now uh, a lethal, basically a lethal dose. And that's one of the things really, really driving this. Nick Miroff, we're so glad that you were able to come on the show and share more about how this reporting team together. I commend folks to uh, read it, Washington Post, WashingtonPost.com, however they get their news. Thank you, Nick. Appreciate you coming on. Thank you. NBC News covers hundreds of stories every single day because you couldn't possibly read or watch or listen to them all. Our bureau teams have done it for you. This is what they tell us is going down in their regions in a segment we call The Local. From our Western Bureau, a 68-year-old man is in stable condition after getting attacked by a shark in Hawaii. Police on the Big Island say this guy was swimming when a 12-foot tiger shark bit him somewhere on his torso. Our Honolulu affiliate says investigators said the man tried fighting it off with a diving knife and the shark went away. Last week, a woman went missing after an apparent shark attack while snorkeling off Maui. Also from our Western Bureau, Oregon Governor Kate Brown says she is commuting the sentences of all 17 people on death row in her state. They're now sentenced to life without the possibility of parole. Brown has less than a month left in office. The death penalty is legal in Oregon, but the state has not executed somebody since 1997. From our Northeast Bureau, those sailors missing on their trip from New Jersey to Florida have been found alive and safe. Remember we told you about that this week? A tanker vessel crew spotted them like 200 miles off the coast of Delaware yesterday, waving their hands, waving a flag. Officials say the boat had no fuel, no power when they were found. They are in New York tonight, reuniting with their families and getting medical treatment. Tell you what, it's nice we can bring you like a good follow-up to a story like that that we do. So we're glad to see that those guys are safe and sound. Coming up. Tributes pouring in, pouring in for Twitch. Stephen Boss, the former DJ for the Ellen DeGeneres show, 
who died today in an apparent suicide. We're going to have the latest on this and how people are remembering his life and his legacy. People around the country, including and especially in Hollywood today, rocked by the news that DJ Twitch, Stephen Boss, has died of an apparent suicide at the age of 40, according to the L.A. coroner's office. A lot of people knew him because of, look, his, his role on The Ellen Show. He was the DJ there. He joined the show in 2014, and before that, he was a finalist and judge on So You Think You Can Dance. That's where he met his wife, Allison, who was also a dancer. He always was posting on Instagram, right? He posted this video of the two of them dancing just a matter of days ago. She released a statement today saying, in part, Stephen lit up every room he stepped into. He valued family, friends, and community above all else. And leading with love and light was everything to him. Kate Snow has been following the reaction today. There has been so much of it because, Kate, um, it came as just such a shock to so many people. Um, this is somebody who, who people kind of knew because he was in our living rooms. Yeah. If you watched Ellen, you, you knew Twitch, you know? Exactly. Yeah, that's right. And I think, Hallie, it kind of speaks to what we hear a lot about mental health, which is sometimes people put on a brave face or they, they you know, they put on an outwardly looking like everything is absolutely fine. And unfortunately, when someone's struggling, they can sometimes be masking how they're really feeling. I also want to point out the numbers. Hallie, you know this. We've reported so extensively on how the number of suicides in this country, unfortunately, have skyrocketed right across the board for all pop all the population but if you look specifically at black americans they've had the highest spike in recent years so unfortunately twitch becomes uh, another of of many many people who have died mm -hmm. we spoke with a psychologist at the university of houston about this this afternoon rita walker she's a woman of color herself and she says she often hears from people in the black community hallie that that there's a reluctance to seek help or that there's a sense of pride in keeping up appearances and looking mm. like everything is okay. Now, again, we don't we don't know what happened with Twitch. We don't have those details, and we may, we may never. But um, those are some of the trends that we're seeing. I'm just looking at some of the video that we're showing of Twitch with Ellen. Uh, you yeah. know, he was, I, I think, also he, he ended up being an executive producer on the show. Yes. I mean, he guest hosted. I remember, I remember watching it when she was out. Yeah. Um, she is reacting obviously today. So many people. There's just been such an outpouring of tributes yeah. to somebody who, as his wife so aptly said, brought love and light into this world in so many ways. Yeah, that's absolutely right. And, and remember when her show ended back in May? There was this big tribute to Twitch. I mean, she, she, you know, yeah. she said he was my guy. I'm heartbroken. And is her tweet. Twitch was pure love and light. He was my family. I loved him with all my heart. She said back in May that they would, at the end of each show, they would say, I love you. I love you. That's what they would say mm -hmm. to end their day and go home. There are other many, many other posts on social media this afternoon from many, many celebrities. Adam Lambert was one of them, mm. calling him warm and joyful. Paula Abdul said he greeted the world every day with a beautiful smile. Kerry Washington said the world lost a bright light. I mean, there's a trend, there's a there's a common theme here, Hallie, right? Everyone's saying that he lit people up. He brought joy. And his wife did say today that she hopes that joy, that positivity continues to be his legacy. Uh, you know, he had three children and they, the yeah. family asked for privacy. Kate Snow, thank you so much. I appreciate you doing so much reporting on this and bringing this to us. We'll look for more tomorrow on NBC News Daily, 2 to 4 Eastern. We should note, too, if you or somebody you know is struggling, there is help. There is help available to you. It is simple. It is 988. That's a number that is not tough to remember, right? Take a quick screen grab if you need it. You can also text home to the crisis text line 741741. Again, call or text 988 if you need help. That does it for us this hour. We'll see you more for more coverage right here tomorrow. Thanks for watching our YouTube channel. Follow today's top stories and breaking news by downloading the NBC News app.